Okay, hello, welcome back. I hope you all had a very good weekend, and thank you for coming back to the next broadcast. Uh, so this is the intermediate class for SETA College Online, um, and as always, I'm your teacher, Austin. Uh, so I hope you're ready, uh, because we have a very good lesson planned for today. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, uh, the next step from our previous video. So if you didn't see the previous video, I really do recommend watching the last one, uh, because this is basically the next step. So uh, my lessons tend to carry from video to video, um, but this one specifically is just the next step from our first conditionals. That's what we talked about last video, and we're now going on to the next. So please, if you haven't, go watch that one. If you had, or if you were here for the last video, well then, let's get started. Uh, so, as I, as I said, we're going to continue from the first conditional, and so we're going to talk this lesson about second conditionals. Uh, so, you know, these things work in steps, so we're going to look at both during this lesson, um, because we need a little bit of both. So there will be some revision and review. Um, I'm going to go back over some of the key ideas from the previous lesson, um, but this is going to be a little quicker, and then we'll continue to the second conditionals. And then at the end, our vocabulary, our houses, and homes today. All right, so as I said, we're going to do a little bit of review. Um, one of the key concepts I talked about in the last video are clauses. Um, so I'm just going to briefly uh, cover this again just to remind everyone. Um, so remember there are two types of clauses. They were independent, which were totally complete, and dependent, which were incomplete. Um, so, so this is the, the key concept here for clauses, that we have two separate parts or two separate kinds, and how they work together is how, uh, how it determines the, the grammar of the sentence. Remember that a clause are the smaller parts of a sentence. So, you know, you can take a sentence, break it into smaller parts. Those smaller parts are clauses. So, you know, if you remember my example from the previous video, I like ice cream and I like cake. That's one sentence. Um, but we have two independent clauses. We can separate it. I like ice cream. I like cake. Both of those are totally complete sentences. So we say they're independent clauses. On the other hand, I can take a different sentence. Before I go to work, I always eat breakfast. So that's one sentence again. But now we have uh, both types. We have a dependent incomplete clause, before I go to work. Well, that's not finished, you know. Before I go to work, what? Um, it's incomplete. So that's one type. And then we have the other, the independent clause, I always eat breakfast. So um, again, that is a complete sentence, I always eat breakfast. So there we have the two different types, a dependent and an independent clause. Um, this is important um, because it affects how we talk about conditionals. So again, as I said, we're going to review that first conditional. This is to talk about future situations and possible consequences, real things. The first conditional is all about real events and real ideas. And the form is the present simple. So we have a dependent clause here the if word, plus our present simple. That's our dependent clause. And in that, we use uh, the present simple verb. After that, we use will in our independent clause, subject plus will, and then verb in the base. So, you know, if I look at our timeline I made, you're standing now, and you're talking about two possible futures. You know, if this happens, I'll do this, and then if not, this will happen. So that's really what you're thinking about with the first conditional. Real options, real choices that are likely, that are possible for the future. And so here are these examples. If it rains this afternoon, I'll take the bus. So in our dependent clause, if it rains this afternoon, we have rains in present simple. And then in the independent clause, I will take the bus home, we have our will verb. So, you know, that's how the first conditional works. Um, it's always going to be present simple and will, and it's always going to be about real, real things, you know, things that are possible, things that you think 
might happen. Um, and so that's just my, my brief review. You know, these two concepts of clauses and the first conditional are very important because we now need to take both of those ideas and bring them over to our second conditional. So that's our main focus for today, the second conditional. So how are they different? You know, what's the difference between the second conditional and the first conditional? Um, because they're not the same, they have different names. <laughs> we have first and second. So instead, you know, the first conditional is talking about real situations. Now we're talking about hypothetical and imaginary situations. Um, and so these are things that are not true, uh, things you do not think are possible. And the form is, so, and so the form is different. The form changes now to if plus past simple. So we go from the present simple in the first conditional to the past simple in the second conditional. We change verb time. And then in the next, in the, in the independent clause, instead of will, we now use would. So the structure is if plus past simple plus would verb in the base. And so the concept, you can kind of think about it this way. So here is our timeline. We are, we are right now. We are talking right now. And our future is this. You know, we know, we know this will happen in the future. And now I'm standing now and I'm imagining this extra future, this, this, you know, this different option, this alternate path, and I'm imagining what, w what would happen. What do I think would happen in this future? What would be the outcomes? What would be the events? So that's what the second conditional is. It's about that, that imagination, that idea for the future. And so if I look at some examples, if I won the lottery, I would buy a house. That's kind of the, the example that, you know, every teacher, I think, uses this example for the second conditional. Um, but, you know, it shows it very well. So I'm standing now, and I'm imagining. I'm just thinking, oh, if I won the lottery. Well, one future, one possibility is I would buy a house. So you're just doing that kind of planning for your imaginary future. Or we can do something less... Um, less fantastic, we can say, Sandra would go to the park if she had more time. So this one, we're still thinking about this, this future here, you know. Uh, Sandra, it does not have time, but if she had time, she would go to the park. And so that is the imagined option, the kind of imaginary future we have. Um, but, you know, in, in all of this, it's always about the imaginary thing, and it's always about something you know that probably isn't real or isn't true right now. Um, and it works the same way for our grammar and our writing. So the if is always a dependent clause. And so if the dependent clause comes first, we use a comma. If the dependent clause comes second, there is no comma. Um, so just remember that for writing. You know, all conditional sentences work the same way. You know, there are many different kinds. There's first sec conditional, there's second conditional, there's a third conditional, and there's something called mixed conditionals. No matter wh whatever conditional you are talking about, they all have the same comma, comma rule here. If, 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 <laughs> if, if is first, comma, here. If, if is second, no comma. That's it. Okay, um, but this is not everything about the second conditional. There are some more notes I want to talk about. So number one is that you can use could instead of would with the second conditional. Um, it, you know, it, it's really, they're pretty similar. It really doesn't change one to the other, um, except maybe could has more of an idea with actions, maybe. Um, but really, they're, they're quite equal. They're very, very equal and the same. So you can use either would or could for your second conditional. Um, the next is that uh, the form rules change, though. So the rules for verb to be are different from, the, from a normal sentence to conditionals. So when you're using verb to be, 
in the second conditional, we use were for I, he, she, and it. Um, th this is a rule. Um, it, it's an old rule in English. Um, it, it's, a, it's a change to show that it is imaginary. Um, and so instead of saying I was, he was, she was, or it was, we will say I were, he were, she were, and it were. So we're using the plural form for all of these singular ideas. Now, this rule is not 100%. Many, many English speakers will use was. I was, he was, she was, it was. Um, many will. And so this is kind of, this is a rule that you see a lot in books, in grammar books. Um, and so, and it is correct. This, this is the correct way to speak this. Um, I'll show an example in a moment. Um, but just know you don't have to. You know, it's kind of you can and you cannot. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, you don't always have to talk about imaginary clauses or imaginary ideas with an if conditional. You can talk about imaginary ideas in different ways. So I'll show an example of that. So first, number one. If I had a bigger oven, I could make better cakes at home. So in number one, um, I'm, I'm showing this, this difference between could and would. Um, so since this is about, you know, ability, you know, if I had a bigger oven, I, I, I could have this ability to do this. Um, that's why I have the idea of actions, you know, kind of things that you, that you, can, you can do if, if things changed. Um, of course, I could say would. If I had a bigger oven, I would make better cakes at home. That's fine, too. Um, but just know, you, you can see both forms, and, and they really don't mean anything different. They're basically the same, but sometimes with actions, we're more likely to say could instead of would. But. So now I'm going to talk more about this number two rule here. Um, if I were you... I wouldn't travel without an umbrella. This is a very common expression. If I were you, or if you were me, you know, that idea of I am offering advice. So uh, I'm thinking about this hypothetical situation, and I, I'm imagining that if I were in your position, I, I, I change places, this is what I would do. Um, so this kind of expression here, if I were you, is very common. And this is where that change happens. So um, the correct thing is, if I were you. Um, many, many English speakers will say, if I was you. So that is very common as well. Um, so th this rule, number two, is kind of your choice. Um, you know, for tests and for, you know, examinations, this rule is important. Um, but when you're speaking, uh, I, I wouldn't worry too much. It, you know, if, if people from the, the UK and the United States and Canada, if they change, they say, I was, well, then there you go. That's the rule. Um, so I, I would say, take this rule as you want it. And then number three, um, my perfect holiday would be on a tropical island. So here you can just use would and the verb uh, would be to make an imaginary situation, you don't have to use the conditional. I could say, you know, if I had a perfect holiday, it would be on a tropical island. That's fine, but you do not need it. You don't need that whole conditional for every imaginary ideas. You can just use the auxiliary modal would to make those imaginary situations. Just so, just so you can see, there are other ways. There are other ways to do this. All right. However, I have more notes. <laughs> the condition, the second condition, you think, oh, so simple. Well, no, there are more to consider. So now I just want to talk about, you know, when when is it really good to use the first, and when is it really good to use the second? So the first is always for real situations and real outcomes, things that you think are possible, and the second is only for situations that you know are not real or are not possible. So 
So I'll, I'll show two examples to compare. If I have time, I will help you move house. So in this example, if I have time, I will help you. This means I believe it is possible. It is very likely that I will have time in the future. And if I do, I will help you. You know, maybe you are going home that evening. And then after you cook dinner, if I have time, I'll help you. I believe after I cook dinner, I'll have time. However, I can do it second conditional. If I had time, I would help you move house. This one's the opposite. This is I know I will not have time. I know that I have a doctor's appointment. I cannot help you. Um, so I know that I won't have time. So I say the second conditional. That's when, that's when the difference is important. And that's when the, it, it, it's important to use the first or the second in the correct situation. Because you really want to make sure for the first conditional, you believe that this is possible. And in the second, you know it's not possible. All right, so let's do some practice with this then. So I'm going to show you a first or second conditional sentence. You need to decide, is it first? Is it second? And then you also need to decide what's the correct verb. So here are some notes. For the first, remember it's if plus the present simple and then will and the verb in base. And then for the second, it's if plus the present simple and would and the verb in base. So uh, those are there just to help because, you know, we go very fast, so I always give you the notes. So let's look at the problems. Number one, the workers into trouble if they didn't wear the company hat. The workers into trouble if they didn't wear the company hat. So is it first? Is it second? And then, depending, how do I complete this? So take a moment, have a think. What is the correct way? OK, correct answer is would get. This is a second conditional. The workers would get into trouble if they didn't wear the company hat. So we've got our past, our past tense here. You know, if plus past tense, if they didn't. So I know that this is would, would get. You can always look for the other parts um, because these forms are, are, you know, are set. They don't change. Um, so you can always look at the other to see what the correct is. All right, how about this one? If you dinner, I'll do the dishes after. If you dinner, I'll do the dishes after. So. What is it? First conditional, second conditional, and then how do I finish the sentence? All right. Have your guess? Well, it is cook. This is the first conditional sentence. Here I know because we have apostrophe LL, so we know it'll be I will do the dishes, will first. Um, so the complete sentence, if you cook dinner. So no change even, just cook because it's present simple. All right, here's the next, number three. If you sit under the beach umbrella, you sunburn. If you sit under the beach umbrella, you sunburn. Um, in case anyone is not totally clear, a sunburn is when, you know, you are on the beach, the sun is very bright, um, and it, it makes your skin red. It damages your skin because, you know, you have too much sun, you get very red, it hurts. Um, so that's a sunburn. So what do we think? First or second? All right. You have your answer? Okay. The answer is won't get. This is a first conditional. So we know because sit is in present simple, if you sit. So I know the second is this, and negative, so we have the negative contraction, won't, because I know that if you sit under the umbrella, you will not get sunburned, so won't get. All right, the next. What would you do if you, your job? What would you do if you, your job? First or second? I think that's 
easy. Always look for the parts. Look at our forms here to find your parts. And now we just need, what is the correct form of lose? Well, this is an irregular. Don't forget, this is an irregular verb. So the correct answer is lost. So what would you do if you lost your job? All right, so, you know, and to lose your job is to be fired, really. All right, the next, number five. If she made more money, she a bigger house. If she made more money, she... A bigger house. So again, first or second. First or second conditional, and then what is the correct form for buy? All right, have a think. Have an answer. Okay. It is would buy, second conditional. So if she made more money, she would buy a bigger house. Now we're over in the independent clause for the second uh, because we have our if already finished, if she made, past tense, more money. Okay, final question. If you could change one thing in your life, what? So, yeah, this one now, we have a question conditional. So, I threw this in just to give an example. Uh-oh, what do we do for questions? <laughs> um, so, I've given you the subject, it, and the verb, be. So, what is the correct way to write and finish this question? So is it first, second, and then question? Hmm. All right, I'll give you a moment to think about this one. It's a little trickier. All right. So let's see if you have the right answer. So this is a second conditional, and the correct is would it be? So always remember in questions we do this. We do the switch. What would it be? So. We take our second conditional, if you could change one thing in your life, what would it be? So we've done the switch here. So instead of it would be, what would it be? All right. Um, you know, questions or conditionals can be a little tricky because we have different clauses. Um, just remember, questions always happen in the independent clause here. They'll always be in the independent clause and they follow the same switching of the subject and the verb. So we would switch will in the subject or would in the subject, just like this, um, to make the question. You know, if you could change one thing in your life, what would it be? Um, you know, we can change this example. Number three for a question, if you sit under the breach umbrella, will you get sunburned? So again, we just swap the the subject you and the auxiliary verb will, will you get sunburned? So the second, the question, if you make any conditional question, it always happens right here in the independent clause, the main sentence, and you just switch will or would for the subject and you're done. Okay, so that's everything for the grammar practice. Let's now move on to some housing and home vocabulary. So. I have a very interesting picture. It's a very interesting home, very, <laughs> very modern, uh, very expensive. Maybe some of you like it. Maybe some of you think, oh gosh, that's the ugliest home. Um, but <laughs> I, I needed a picture which had all of the parts I needed. So this was the only home with all of the parts you could see. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, just you know, continue with me, believe with me, I will be able to talk about everything. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is this part of the home. Um, try to guess if you if you know. Try to try to think. What do you call this part? This is the part of the home where you know if you have a fire, the smoke will come out of the roof of your home. Um, and if you've said it, congratulations! It is chimney. Uh, so that's the chimney of the home. You know, uh, this is a very modern chimney. Another home might have a different style, but it's just, you know, when you have a fire and you need a place for the smoke to go up and out, that's the chimney. The next part I'm going to talk about is this. Um, if you can see, this has glass and this is a door. So you can exit the house and walk outside on this part. Um, and when you can do that, we call it a 
balcony. Yeah, so this is the area where you can stand outside on a high floor, and you know you can go outside and look and stand. Um, so that's called a balcony. Right. The next, um, I, I am not pointing to the window. I'm pointing to this whole part of the house. So you know houses have floors. So when a floor is on the ground, it is the floor that you enter and exit a building. We call it the ground floor or the first floor. Um, first floor is United States English. Ground floor is U English from the UK, British English. So you can take your pick. Um, the, the only difference is numbering. So in the United States, this is the first floor. This is the second floor. In British English, this is the ground floor. And then this is the first floor. Um, so the numbers do change from the United Kingdom and the United States, so just be careful. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's the same thing. It's just the, the part of the building that is on the ground, you know, that you can enter and exit. All right, now let's go below that. So we have ground floor, first floor, or first floor, second floor. Now let's go below the ground. Now we're underground, and that is called the basement, the basement floor. So uh, that's the same for both UK, US, it's called the basement. Next, this, we have a nice, beautiful pool. The pool is, you know, area you can swim. And then next to the pool, this is where you might have a cookout, you might have a grill, you know, make hot dogs, hamburgers, um, kebabs, skewers, all kinds of stuff. You do that on the patio. Yeah, that's the kind of outdoor area to sit, to talk, to drink, to eat. That's the patio. All right, a few more words I just want to talk about. So roof, um, this house, the roof is not very clear, but the roof is just the top cover of a house. So, you know, that's the roof that's above you. The entrance, so this is just the main door of the house. So it, any home, you can say that the front entrance or the entrance, and that's where you can enter and exit the home. That's kind of the, the most important door. And then the fireplace. So if this is the chimney where the smoke exits the home, the fireplace is this part here. This is where you actually um, have and build a fire in your home. Okay, so we're just going to quickly do some pronunciation for all of this. So I'll start up here. So you, I'll say, and then you repeat after me. So chimney, chimney, balcony. Balcony, ground floor, ground floor, or first floor, first floor, basement, oops, basement, pool, pool, and patio, patio. Uh, so my pronunciation of this word is a little different because of my accent. Um, I say this T as a D sound, patio, patio. Um, you can also say it with a T sound, patio, patio. Um, it's, it's no different your choice, whichever pronunciation is easier for you. Patio, uh, mine, patio, the other. All right. So... Uh, oh, and then roof, entrance, fireplace. Okay, um, so we're going to continue, though, with home and housing because we have a very, very fun thing to talk about, and those are prepositions. Yes, yes, prepositions. So I'm going to show you these six sentences, um, and then what I want you to do is try to decide is the correct preposition in or on. I know, oh god, in or on. <laughs> um, but uh, don't worry, the, these will always be the same. You just have to know which one is correct. But in every way, we'll always say it this way. So number one, I live the country surrounded by trees. So, you know, I don't live in the city. I live outside of the city. And we say I live 
in the country. Yes, correct preposition is in. Okay, number two. I live the outskirts of New York. Um, if you don't know outskirts, that's just the, the outer edge of a city. I'll talk more in a moment. But what do you think, in or on? Do you live in the outskirts or on the outskirts? Well, in this case, we live on. And you live on the outskirts of a city. Okay, number three. I live in a small town or I live on a small town? What do you think, in or on? This one is in. Yeah, I live in a small town. How about number four? What's your guess? I live in a city on the East Coast or in the East Coast? Yeah, so the coast here, talking about the, the part of a country that touches the ocean. Yeah, so we say, what do you think? On. Yeah, so you live on the coast. Um, it can be the North Coast, the South Coast, the East Coast, the West Coast, whatever coast. Um, you always live on the coast. Okay. Number five. I live in the fifth floor of my apartment building or on the fifth floor of my apartment building? What do you think? In or on? Have a guess. It is on. So I live on the fifth floor of my apartment building. And then finally, number six. I live in a quiet suburb or I live on a quiet suburb. Yeah, this one's similar to outskirts, similar idea. But what do you think, in or on? Well, of course, we use in <laughs> because we have to change, of course. Um, so I live in a quiet suburb. So yes, um, for these, you just kind of have to remember which one is most natural. Um, the, the, there is no very good rule that I can tell you, uh, but just remember, it will always be this way. You live in the country, on the outskirts, in a town, a city, uh, a village. You live on a floor, and you live in the suburb. So it's always that way. So if you just, if you learn them together, you'll always be correct. So let's talk about these three words here, the country, the outskirts, and a suburb. So the country, this is just the, the rural area outside of a city. So, you know, a city is an urban area, lots of buildings and roads and construction. Rural is the opposite. Uh, that's where the farming happens, forest, mountains. Um, and you can also call that the country. All right. Next, the outskirts. This is just the far edge of a city. So this is the, the transition between urban and country. We have these little edges of a city. Those are the outskirts. And then finally, a suburb. So this is inside of a city. You know, inside of a city, you have offices and businesses and homes all mixed together. But sometimes, a city will build a very special, you know, a special area section just for houses. And it's just houses and houses and houses. This is very, very popular in the United States. You know, you'll have just streets and streets and streets of houses. Those sections of the city are called suburbs. Um, all right, um, and those are just those are just some some key some key prepositions to use in addition to the vocabulary we just did. But all right, that is everything for today's lesson. So you know, thank you so much. I'm just going to quickly go through a quick review of everything we talked about. Uh, so this is, as I said, we talked about the second conditional a lot today. We did some review for clauses and the first conditional. Um, as I suggested in the beginning of the video, if you felt a little confused about clauses and a little confused about the first conditional, um, go please watch my, my previous video, my last video, because that's where we talked in detail about all of that. Um, what I talked about today was just a quick review. Um, and so the structure for the second conditional was if plus the past simple and would so that's, what, that's what's important for this one, the past simple and would. Um, and then, as I said, we compared the first and the second for our grammar activity to try to you know, separate which one is which. Um, and then in addition to that, we talked about all that vocabulary for houses and where you live, where your home is, all of that stuff. OK. Well, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, I hope you have a very good afternoon. I hope you learned something new. 
Um, and I definitely hope to see you again uh, for the next intermediate lesson. So as I said, have a good afternoon, and thank you so much. Bye-bye.